I'm Madeline Tubiana. I'm an associate professor and the Desmarais uh, Chair of Entrepreneurship at the University of Ottawa. I'm still also uh, affiliated with the University of Alberta, where is where I took my first position. Um, so that's who I am. To describe my research interests, I'd say if I wanted to categorize it all in one thing, I'd say I have an overarching interest in processes of social change, what stalls, what supports social change. Um, but when I look at that, it kind of falls into four buckets about what influences that. So I'm interested in the role of institutional processes in social change. I'm interested in the role of emotions, which have been absent for a lot of the theorizing. Um, I've been interested in the role of stigma and specifically stigmatized actors. And then more recently, I've been interested in the role of entrepreneurship. Yeah, for me, it is around um, the social change aspect. Like, I'm fundamentally interested in 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 those components. So I I really ever undergirding most of my projects, even though they might be in really different contexts. You know, from the sex industry, the taxi industry, all over the map. What guides them is to me is something that's about social change, whether that be at the individual level, how we change our identities and emancipate ourselves from constraints, or whether that's at an institutional level and how we change the institutions that are in fact marginalizing us. Even though those seem like different contexts or different levels of analysis, to me, what guides and you know decides whether or not I'll start a project is really that component. said as, as I care about social change I want my work to have meaning right and I think that um, there's a lot of context and people we have ignored in our in our theorizing because they face stigma or they exist in the shadows and I think for my work to have impact on society but and also theoretically these contexts are critical because um, we can't understand social change if we just look at accounting forms or big big firms because what we've unbased our theory on are things that are not a complete impact on society and as I think you know one of the things is we're getting constant push to have more relevance more impact and I question myself you know when we're doing this work when you're spending days and days revising an introduction and writing one sentence again and again sometimes your work can feel a little like am I having an impact on the world? Is this meaningless? Just crafting sentences after sentences. And so to me, um, knowing that I'm, I'm trying to give voice and bring more inclusiveness into our theorizing and have like be able to take that further helps me kind of stay motivated myself. So when I was deciding to do my dissertation on prisons, on the prison system, um, there had never been a piece published yet in a man top management journal. And uh, also I was, I was, so I was having lunch with Tom Lawrence and he's like, you know, you got to be careful. You don't want to be known as the prison lady, you know, and this idea that when you're doing such an extreme context, it ha can have a very imprinting effect on your identity. That could be concerning. Do I want to be the prison lady? Um, as well as you, there's this risk, even when I was the first year of my PhD program, they're like, oh, well, you can't just do qualitative research. You'll never get a job. And I was like, okay, well, thank you for that advice, but I'm going to ignore it because I want to study these contexts. And so, you know, one of the challenges is that people are hesitant, are worried for you. They think you're not going to be able to make it. You won't be able to publish. And uh, I think you have to push through that if you really want to believe in this. And, you know, lucky for me, I was able to publish my prison paper in AMJ and I'm probably not known as a prison lady <laughs> later on. I think I'm starting to be known as a sex work industry lady, which is probably more concerning. So, uh, you know, I guess I just have to keep switching it up a little bit so um, I don't get labeled by my contacts. Uh, but the fact that you didn't ask me, what's it like being the prison lady means that maybe I've succeeded. So I think that's one of the challenges in terms of who you are as a scholar and navigating our world and, and trying to get things. There's lots of other specific challenges about how to access these populations, how to theorize from them, how to relate it, how to talk about transferability. Um, I do think that entrepreneurship can be one mechanism. Um, it's not a panacea though. We, let's not overstate the, 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 what it can do. But uh, Trish Rubottom and I, who's my co-author on the, the sex work industry project, 
you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and writing about what entrepreneurship could do and help in terms of social change, the limits and possibilities. And one of the things that it can help do is it can be a vehicle to obtain voice, power, and respectful relations. And that is a social change element in terms of the, the lived experience of, of people. Now, and through that, and through the, the having voice, power, and respectful relations, you can start to allow change to, to filter up by you opening your own ventures that change the rules of the game in one space that then might have an impact on the other. Um, so I think that that is an important sort of micro mechanism of social change. And then we have all the other ones that that filter out different strategies. Sometimes embracing your own stigma uh, can be a tool to mobilize change. You know what I mean? N not just hiding it or wait, sometimes leaning into it and using it as a, as, a, as a strategy can help social change. So there's lots of different elements that can help. But I think um, I've been thinking a little bit about, yeah, the entrepreneurship and the and the importance of getting finding pathways to voice power and respectful relations as sort of micro um, elements of social change that can then help and support the sort of macro elements of social change that need to be happening on systems and institutions. Um, that's a really good question because it was a very big challenge. There's a reason it's a seven year study. It did not, um, it was not, so I'm doing a study right now on menopause and we could were able to get 40 interviews in one year. Um, for the sex industry, it took us seven years to, to get close to saturation. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in there, but it is it was hard to access because they didn't want to speak to outsiders. And a lot of their experience had been being stigmatized and come in and observed and be like, from sociologists who were coming in and studying them as feminists and be like, how can we save you? And and that was that was a real hurdle. They didn't want to speak to any outsiders. So there was a couple things we had to do to overcome this that eventually is what led us into to more momentum. And um, the first thing was that we created Twitter accounts, two different Twitter accounts. Um, we started building a profile related to different. So one was more abolitionist, one was supportive of things. We engaged with uh, sex workers on the platform they were using. And eventually, once we had a thing, we reached out to them through DMs and things like that. So we started to get following there. Um, and um, the other thing is we actually had to go out and be at a sex club, at activist march marches, and like be present in those places that show that we were not, that we understood and were willing to be part of that world. Um, and then that opened up um, ways to access. And then the last piece, which is where I think it was a trigger point for us, is when we started asking them about their work and 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 talking to them as entrepreneurs and they were so excited to get acknowledged for the work they were doing because a lot of them felt this way they were talking about their marketing and their production design and how they were trying to access the market but nobody saw that everyone wanted to approach them as some sort of stigmatized little woman at the corner and how can we free you they wanted to be heard as as professionals for the work they're doing they wanted to be seen as entrepreneurs and so when we started to talk to them about that, then the, all those networks that I, I talk about in sort of the ASQ paper the, the opened up. And so more people were willing to talk to us and more people were willing to talk to us. And I think that was a, a game changer for us. Well, that's the hard work, isn't it? I think we all know that's, that, that's the hard work. Um, and uh, it doesn't happen like that and it doesn't usually happen on the first try. So I think about it as you're trying on clothes and you're like, oh, too big, oh, too small. What am I, like, you know your story, right? Uh, each of you knows the story in your data. You know it so well. But the thing with our contacts and things is that they're so complex. There's many aspects of the story. There's interweaving components. It could be so many things. And that's where it really takes this effort to deeply engage with the literature and you know like there's the, the literature on provisional selves this idea when you're in transition you you try on a version of yourself and I think of it as provisional papers you have to be willing to try things on um and as you engage with literature so like you know we I, I presented it your thing the burlesque paper that's an example of a paper that's really been trying to find 
its theoretical contribution um, out of that story. And uh, you have to spend a lot of time in the literature to make sure you really understand, is this what this is going on here? Is this different enough? Is it doing something that we wouldn't expect? How, and then and then once you see that, you say, okay, you read deeply enough and say, okay, yeah, there is something here that wouldn't be explained by existing theory. Then you go back and see if it works. So it's this very much iterative provisional process of engaging with your story, go to the literature that you feel you have a hunch for, get lost in it until you're like, yes, there is something or there isn't, move on. And then have conversations with people to see if, if they think it sticks or not. Taking that with a grain of salt, because everyone sees their theoretical frame in your context. So you have to be careful with that too. If, if you can get very lost, if you just present and share your work to a lot of people and be like, what do you see? And they'll be like, I see an institutional story. And somebody else will be like, I see a category story. And somebody else will be like, I see identity story. And then you're like, what do I do? You have to move a little bit away from that because there are so many potential theoretical stories you could tell. So you have to make a choice between one, the one that resonates with you and where you feel like that you are changing the conversation or your theory does something different because there's so many um, angles you could potentially take. So it can get you really lost if you listen a little bit too much. You want to hear them, but not follow every lead. But I believe that the top journals really want to publish good work, right? So I don't think the context necessarily matters if you're doing really good work. Um, so and by really good work, I mean you're really pushing the literature forward and you've got very solid methods. So the first thing I would say is if I'm publishing a top journal, I know I have to have my methods totally clean. They have to be absolutely right. That's the number one thing when I tell PhD students, I know you might ask me this later, what's the most important thing in your dissertation? It's about getting your methods down, clean, organized, structured, whether you're quant or qual, this is your chance to get really good data, make sure it's organized, make sure it's transparent, because that's what gives you the chance at an r, &R. So that's, that's just a little bit of an aside from the question you've asked me, because I think in terms of targeting, I always shoot up um, to, to the stars. I'm, I'm willing to, to fall um, wherever it lands. And then which journal I choose is about feeling I get. It feels like um, more like kind of the story I wouldn't want to tell in this journal than that. No, I can have that feeling. And then that journal does not feel the same way. And so we move on. You know what I mean? At first, um, when I was writing the the um, my paper in the prison context, so the paper on institutional logics and identity, I thought it was an ASQ pen of story. And I went for a round, I, I got an R&R &R there and then it got bumped out. And so I had to reorganize myself and shuffle it. And, and now that it, it did end up at AMJ, it feels like it's an AMJ paper. So, you know what I mean? Like it, it, you can have a hunch about your paper, shoot for that. And then you don't always get to choose where your paper ends up either. Right. I think the a goal is to try and do your best work, shoot it for the, the the top journals so that you go through that process because the process, the revision process makes your papers better. It's painful, it's hard, it takes years sometimes, but you're you you can want you know that you've done everything. And I feel really good about those papers in the end. And I think that process is worth it. And even if you do get rejected in that process and then spend some days mourning and crying and <laughs> drinking your sorrows away or whatever it is that you do. Uh, um, your paper's further along. It's better. You, you know what I mean? It's for the next place. So I think they're going to publish the context just because they've never published the context before. It still has to be pushing the theoretical conversation. I think if you're publishing a context that's been published tons, your bar for your theoretical contribution might be even higher um in terms of, of things but no matter what in these journals it's about can you push the, the the theoretical conversation forward so the biggest piece of targeting a journal is that last bit we just talked about can you turn your story into something theoretically important so that's a that's an important question and I think that 
often they're really specific to the context. So each paper has very specific kind of practical implications that are unique to that context, unlike the level that I'm theorizing at, right? So it's much further down 11. Um, you know, my my work with prisoners when I was looking at how do they trans their identity transitions out of institutions, right? And the, the ways in which identity is tied up with logics. Now that's very theoretical language, but fundamentally it's about can they um, stop the cycle? Can they find a new identity after being so tainted and stigmatized? Can they move on? Um, and many of them don't, right? So I have a personal connection to this because my dad was a forensic psychiatrist. So he, I grew up uh, knowing how many people just cycled in and out of the system. Um, and it was on my mind a little bit when I was reading the logics and identity work. And sorry, I'm going a little on a side story. I told you I like to talk. Um, anyways, the, the point to come back to the, the practical relevance at the end of the day is, is two was in this case was two things. One, like you have to, you have to find an, you, these new visions of yourself that exist in societal's acceptable structures. You, they have to understand what those might be. Um, and those have to be made available to them, which usually they're not. Um, and, and that's the sort of structural piece. But one of the things that I think was a really important piece of practical relevance here was, um, talking about the downside of the rehabilitative logic in prison system. So specifically victim narratives. So this idea that when we move, so for a long time, there's this like very negative narrative where we, we call these people bad, they're bad people and so on. Um, but then the other flip side was to flip to that they're all victims. And the problem with the victim narrative is that it's even more sticky and it reduces agency. And so I think that that's a really important practical piece of advice about when you hold on to a victim narrative, um, you may have been a victim, but it reduces your agency and your capacity and desire to believe you can launch yourself into the future. So I think that was an important piece um, of practical implications that I was trying to say to the, the whole um, prison complex industry. Um, and then, you know, uh, similarly in the sex work, um, field. We're, we're in the process of kind of writing a book trying to articulate this. So I think that's where I was pointing to the about um, voice power and respectful relations. And I think that's one element. But the other one is about in stigmatized industries or occupations, um, the dynamics of stigmatization can undermine their ability to collectively come together for social change, right? And I, do, and I think when we studied the industry, it was in the middle of the, the laws had been struck down in Canada. They were trying to mobilize, but they couldn't come together because they couldn't find a common narrative because they had so many different layers and complexity in their stigmatization. And I think that for those agents, for those activist group, for all of those people, kind of pointing that out and, and showing that the dynamics of stigmatization were harming their ability to collectively improve the conditions for everybody and the importance of finding, despite differences, a common unifying identity or narrative that, that they can be used um, is critically important. I guess the last one I would say is this, is that entrepreneurship has been seen as something for white dudes. Um, uh, and a lot of people are afraid to say that they are an entrepreneur, can't understand that they claim it. And I think that redefining who entrepreneurship is for by showcasing more people is a really important practical relevation like implication of my work that I talk about when I have a lot of talks that I give to alumni or various audiences. I, I think that there's there's a lot there. Like at the moment I'm studying a menopause in the workplace um, and it has again solidified um, as my other work's done, that so much of our theory is based on masculine experiences and mainstream context, right? And so I think what's missing from our theory is an accounting for how such differences change outcomes in the process of, of change. So I think if there's lots of different conversations, elements about social change, element about institutional change, but within all of those, when we look, when we engage with our literature, what are the assumptions that are coming because of who studied it? how it was studied, where it was studied. And I think, you know, we're in a moment in time where it, it's time to open that black box and say, okay, let's see what we, we've not wanted to include. Mary Douglas talks a lot about boundaries 
in purity and danger. And this idea that certain stuff is kept out because that's the dangerous, that's the impure, that's the stigmatized, right? So if all of our theories has been based on what's inside this boundary, what I think is still missing from the conversation is everything that's outside of that. So what? Uh, uh, how do we expand the boundaries, break them down, blow them up? I don't know. It, that's kind of um, where I am. And I think that that holds for not just my kind of context, but for any kind of context. What? How can we move the boundaries um, and see if what we've even understood is whole? I guess, um, is a book chapter that I wrote with Christy Rogers and Katie DeSells. And it's a book chapter on qualitative methods. And in it, it's called The Fine Line Between Bars in the Handbook of Innovative Qualitative Methods. And in it, we really try and like break down how you might do work in a context that's quite different from what we were taught our qualitative methods in. So like all of those standard things I was kind of taught when I was reading qualitative handbooks about, okay, you've got to maintain objectivity, you have to look professional, you can't ask leading questions, all of these elements that a lot of people know when you go out in the field and you go out and especially in a field where there's weird power distance or you're in a, the, and you can't really, it doesn't work like that. And so in it, we talk, uh, break it down and tell a little bit about the different actual strategy we have. I use, we all use in different, in this case, in the prison context, each of us did, um, I think our dissertation work. I don't know if case was her dissertation work, but all of us did. And so we came together and wrote this uh, chapter. And I think it's a nice little piece um, that sort of tells, it's kind of opens the door about you know, how you might be interviewing and relating in those moments. And I know, Chris, you talked about trust and that's what it's about. You can't, maintain trust in those kinds of situations if you sit there formally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they feel like you're judging them like all of these things like you're not going to have any sort of relationship or interaction you so um you know let's let's change the way we talk about our methods we're not and pr not pretend that we're doing something that we're not you know this thing with quality methods we love to do templates and boiler plates and like pretend like this is how exactly our quality method went. Like, well, let's try and be more honest and that's what i try and do with all of my quality work is in my methods, be super transparent about what actually I did. Not that I, do, oh, I we did this and then we went to the next level of codes and then we went to a category and then we put it in a bubble in a box and everything was perfect. Has anyone, I, I don't know, like, you know, that, that's a very specific, but it's not happening in the context I'm in, I'll tell you. So this is just one piece, kind of trying to do that in one context. Um, I have another paper that I think is probably my most underappreciated paper, probably because I, it's one of my earliest published papers, and it's a little bit different than all my other stuff. Um, so I might as well give that paper a shout out here so it doesn't feel forgotten and ignored by me. <laughs> it's um, So uh, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, a few people, might, if you know me, you might know my Facebook paper that was on uh, like on social media and how they used Facebook and all of that, that was ended up at AMJ with Charlene. But that project was actually a piece of a bigger project where I was studying nonprofit federations. And that was my first kind of RA shit when I was doing my PhD. And um, one of the things we were studying is we were studying nonprofit federations across um, Canada. These federations kind of span across the globe. So they've got multiple components. And in that piece, we kind of talk about how they manage the complexity of that. And um, I like that piece because I think the insights about how to manage um, sort of, we talk about it as internal complexity, but it, well, I see it as an institutional complexity. It had to get peeled away <laughs> from the paper. But it's like uh, this question I, I fundamentally think is important if we are going to deal with any type of uh, social changes. We have to kind of confront the complexity around us. How do you manage that? If it's across uh, countries, whether it's across different belief systems, like I, I think that's an important insight. And because it's a, a specific niche a paper um, around nonprofit federations, some of the insights we have there, I think, get lost. But I think it's important um, in, in helping think about managing uh, complexity a, in a different way. But I'll, I'll share my advice um, and what I think has helped me. Um, so I think I told you in the beginning how a couple of people cautioned me against what I was going to do. 
right? They caution me against qualitative methods. They cautious me against extreme context. Um, so I think when you're doing your, this is especially for PhD students, when you're choosing your dissertation topic, when you're choosing what you want to do, I think you have to really listen to yourself and listen to your passion. And that's not to say you don't take advice about what to do, but I know um, people who were, you know, told, oh, don't study that, don't study this, those are, and then they like never really found their stride because it took the wind out of their sails, so to speak. Like you have to really be to study what you care about or what you're passionate about and and take a risk on that because this is your, you're, you're going to be an academic for the rest of your life. And you going to write and be with these papers for so long. Like you're writing and writing and struggling. If you don't, if you're not interested in it, it does, it just, it's so, it becomes so difficult. And, and more than that, at the end of the day, you're like, is that what I did? Do I feel good about that? Like, is that what I, um, so I always ask my students, like, what do you actually care about? And you should be studying something like related to that. Um, I guess the second one would be, you should engage and uh, take advice and interact with as many scholars as you can, but you should always take that advice with a grain of salt because every piece of advice is based on somebody else's experience from a different set of time, from a different set of period and all their own baggage. And if I had, you know, the same thing, if I had said, don't do qualitative research or don't do this, kind of, my career wouldn't have been what it is. I, I, you know, I was also, when I was studying emotions, that was like early on, like Maxim, I know you guys have talked to him in this as well, sort of opened the door. That was like right in my PhD, this idea of like studying emotion was also very non-mainstream and, and, and risky. So like you have to take advice with a grain of salt. And, and I always go back to this thing that Sarah Kaplan said to, to us at a qualitative working group here in um, Ontario, which is, she was talking about the reviews, which is you need to understand what is the underlying concern. Sometimes the specific details of what they're saying are not the underlying concern. So you sometimes, and I think I, I can extrapolate this to all the different types of advice that you might get in academia or feedback on your paper when you're presenting is, or all of these things, is that you might get very specific feedback that tells you to do something specific. It might not be the specific thing you need to do. It might be the underlying concern. If everybody's telling you, you a different framing for your paper, well, it might be that the framing you have doesn't match, but it doesn't mean you have to go to that specific framing. You might need to do a better job aligning it and keep the same frame, but you need to better align it. Or you might need to think. So I would say, try to get to the bottom of people's concerns rather than chase after little details of things that you're supposed to do. Um, my next bit is about, you know, surrounding yourself with people that bring you joy. Um, collaborate with other PhD students. You know, of course you should co collaborate with your supervisor or other faculty mentors. You can learn a lot from them and you should, but the people that are gonna be with you in the journey that are gonna put in the same amount of work as you, that are gonna help you push your projects forward are other PhD students. Right now, you know, I talked about Trish several times in this interview. We did, we were doing our PhD at the same time. We've been publishing uh, together ever since. Um, my relationships that were in my PhD, whether they were people in my program, or in a similar cohort in time that you met at conferences, like those are people that are going to stay with you throughout your career um, and help you and learn together as well. So I think that's a critical piece that often gets overlooked in an attempt to collaborate with more and more senior scholars, which I'm not saying is not, not important, but it's not the same thing. You need to do both. And um, co-authors should make things fun and, and, and they should bring you joy. And not everybody that you're friends with is the right co-author for you. Um, there are just people you work together well with. I, like I said, Trish and I call each other academic soulmates because just the way that we work together works well. And I have a couple other people that are like that and other people who are, you can be really good friends with, you just don't work the same way. So, you know, have faith in that, be, be selective, make sure you try, because otherwise that can make the process even harder. So don't just bring people on board for the sake of it, whatever they do, like be, be thoughtful about it and try and get joy and fun throughout the process that can be really hard.